Thank you, Alan. Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. We're in a, an exciting part of the big book right now. We're on page 60 in the chapter, How It Works, right after the part that Debbie just read. And it's, for me, this was instrumental. These next three pages were instrumental in me getting sober and staying sober. Uh, without these pages, I would, I don't know what would have happened. So I needed this. So what Debbie read at the end there is, it says, our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostics, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. And that's step one. Okay, so we had to admit that we were an alcoholic and admit that our lives are unmanageable. And then pertinent idea B is that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And that's us coming to grips with the fact that we've asked a million people, we've done it, we've done it as much as we could ourselves. We've tried everything. We've tried talking to everybody about it and nobody that human could get us sober. We just couldn't get sober. And then it says uh, in pertinent idea three, C, that God could and would if he were sought. So that gives us some instructions as to what we need to do from here on out is seeking God. And uh, that's a hard, you know, that's a hard thing to swallow if you're not inclined to that sort of thing, spiritual principles. But it's proven to, to work because we're all sitting here sober. So it works. So we're talking about step three and step three, if we just turn back to page 59, it says made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. So what are we going to do in step three? We're going to make a decision. It's a turning point. It's a decision in our lives. It's going to change our lives. So we have to make a decision. And it's the decision is to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. So what is our will in our lives? Well, our will is our thinking. Our lives are our actions. We go through life having thoughts and actions. Every time we have an action, we've had a thought beforehand. I'm hungry is a thought. And you go to the kitchen and get something to eat. That's an action. So every single thing you do, when you get up in the morning, you get dressed, you say, what, what shirt am I going to wear today? And then you go and get a shirt and put it on, but you have a thought and an action. And we've had many thoughts in the past, such as, I think I'll have a beer. And then we did it, but we had a thought first, and then we did the action of drinking a beer. And with us alcoholics, we had the thought way too often. And we drank way too many beers. We had the action way too many times. And we couldn't stop. So now we got to figure out a way to stop. So remember too, and I missed it the first time I read it. And there's also a sentence in here that kind of leaves out the word. It's the next part, the very next thing says, being convinced we were at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Just what do we mean by that? And just what do we do? But it says, turn our will and our lives over to God. The step itself says, turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. So we're not becoming robots. We're not becoming puppets. We're still independent thinking, acting people when we do this step. But it's like going to a doctor. You can go to a doctor and you make that, you have a thought, I'm not feeling well, I think I should see a doctor. And you go and you see the doctor. And when you're at the doctor, you're turning your will and your life at that moment over to the care of that doctor. And he's going to tell you, you're eating too much fat foods, so stop eating, change your diet. You're not getting enough exercise, get exercise, drink water. And he gives you a whole host of things that you should do. And then you make a decision then as whether you're going to do all of those things. Doctor says, if you have another drink, it's going to kill you. And you walk out of the doctor's office and go have a drink. Then you're not really, you're not really paying attention to what the doctor says. 
if you're supposed to get exercise and you don't exercise, then you're not doing what the doctor said. But you have that choice. You don't have to do what the doctor says. And God is very patient, calm, understanding. And if you don't do what he asked you to do, he doesn't get mad. But your life doesn't get any better and you don't get things accomplished and you still have problems. So basically in step three, we are making a decision as to whether we want to get better or not whether we want to get well, whether we want to get sober or not. And we're making a commitment to that. That decision is a commitment to go ahead and do the rest of the steps. Steps one and two, he had nothing to do. It was all thinking. There was no actions. There's no writing. There was no nothing in steps one and two. Step three, you have to make a decision and you have to take some actions in order to do step three completely and honestly and thoroughly. You know, people say a lot that have been around AA for a while that step four chases a lot of people out. People come in, do steps one, two, and three, and they start to do four and they go out. And some of them say it's because they didn't want to do step five and they go out. But really, it's not doing step three properly that makes you go out. You do it not correctly, you get into step four, and you can't do step four because you don't have the needed help because you never made the decision correctly and turn your will over to the care of God. Turning your will over to the care of God allows you to do step four with no problems and step five also. So you got to make that decision to turn your, your will and your life over to the care of God and he will take care of you. We'll start there with that last paragraph on page 60. It says the first requirement, requirement, this isn't a suggestion, this is a requirement. The first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. So we can do something for a good reason that's not necessarily the best thing to do at the time. We mean to do good, but we're not doing good. It's not the right thing. So we think our motives are good, but it just we, we still have a collision with people, places, and things. Um, most people try to live by self-propulsion. They get their energy, their power, their knowledge, their thinking ability, their reasoning from within themselves and, and try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. So it's got to be our way. Alcoholics are famous for that. They want to do it their way. It says, if his arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Yeah, if you all do exactly what I want you to do, everything's going to be fine. But if you don't do what I want you to do, it's going to be hell. And that's egocentric. That's and alcoholics are famous for that, thinking their way is the best way, period. It's a hard way to be. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, our actor may sometimes be quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest, but as with most humans, he is more likely to have a varied traits. So we can try to be good and have all those virtues, and we might have a few, but there's also other virtues we shouldn't have, but we, and we have some of those. It's all without guidance because we're being guided by self-knowledge, and we learn back in more about alcoholism, that self-knowledge was not sufficient. 
He says, what usually happens? The show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think life doesn't treat him right. Hmm. Life doesn't treat him right. Is he treating life right? Is the question. He decides to exert himself more. He becomes, on the next occasion, still more demanding and gracious as the case may be. Still, the play does not suit him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, he is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. What is the basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? Is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things he wants? And do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is he not, even in his best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Boy, I wish that didn't sound so familiar. That was the way I was at many jobs, wanting to run the whole show, making sure everybody else wasn't slacking off. Meanwhile, while I was doing that, managing everything so well, I wasn't getting anything done myself, so I was part of the confusion and the slacking. Our actor is self-centered, egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. He is like the retired businessman who lolls in the Florida sunshine in the winter, complaining of the sad state of the nation. The minister who sighs over the sins of the 20th century. Politicians and reformers who are sure all would be utopia if the rest of the world would only behave. The outlaw safecracker who thinks society has wronged him and the alcoholic who has lost all and is locked up. Whatever our protestations are not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments, and our self-pity. So, we're selfish. By nature, alcoholics are selfish. We're just selfish people. We always want, we always want what we want never considering what other people want. Get a pizza and you want that odd slice. Or you want that one extra slice that nobody else gets. Everything you do in life, you're trying to get that extra piece of something. It's rough. It's very hard. It's tiring. It's, it wears you out. It makes enemies. It gets you mad. It builds resentments. It makes you angry and self-pitying. And all of those things, all of those emotional things just drive us to drink because we're alcoholics and we have a disease. And when things don't go our way, we pout and we get all pity, self-pitying, and we go, poor me, poor me, pour me another drink. And we're drinking again. Or we're so angry, we say, if I don't get a drink right now, I'm going to go crazy. Well, you're already crazy. That's what, you know, you're acting so angry, you're already crazy, having a drink isn't going to help that, but we insist that it, it must. And so we go get a drink. We get a drink when we're happy, we get a drink when we're sad, we get a drink when we're mad. We, we, just, we just find a million reasons to get drunk, and they're all emotional based. They're based on other things that didn't go our way. We want everything to go our way, and it rarely does. And as long as we're thinking about ourselves only, we don't see the good stuff that's happening for other people and take a little joy out of the fact that other people are doing okay. We're just sorry that we are not doing okay. You know, that they're doing better than us. And it gets into that competition. We get very competitive in our lives. Back in the 50s, they used to talk about keeping up with the Joneses. If the Joneses got a new car, you had to go out and get another car. You had to get a newer car than they had. 
If they got a big TV, you had to go get a bigger TV. And that was the way life went back then. Everybody trying to top everybody else. And it causes just a rat race, a lot of wasted energy, a lot of pain, and we get nowhere. So then, continuing, and here's a, this one sentence. It says, so our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. And when we're in the middle of these problems, we don't think it's us. We think it's them that are causing us to have problems. But this is such an important fact that here we are on page 62, and that statement is here. And then it's repeated again on page 103. On the very last page of our 12 steps, on the last page of working with others, the last paragraph written in italics says, after all, our problems were of our own making. Bottles were only a symbol. Besides, we have stopped fighting anybody or anything. We have to. So that's an ominous warning that comes later on in the book at the end of the 12 steps when we're working with other alcoholics that we have to remember and we have to tell them too that the bottles are only a, a, a symbol, a symptom of our problem, of our, of our way of life. So we had, we had the bottles that always tried to save us and then the bottles ate us up because we crawled into the bottom of a bottle and drowned there. So our problems were of our own making. The good news about that sentence is, it's in the past tense, our problems were of our own making instead of where it says here, we think basically, basically our troubles were of our own making. All right. So they arise out of ourselves and the alcohol is an extreme example of self will run riot, though he doesn't usually think so above everything. We alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We're in step three, and it's so step three is telling us we have to get rid of selfishness here in step three, because if we carry that through to the rest of the steps, we're going to be blindsided by our own selves and the rest of the steps. So it's important at this juncture to get rid of the selfishness and not only get rid of selfishness, but along with that, deflate the ego. Get out of the center of the universe because up to now, I know when I first came in, I felt like I was the center of the universe. Everything revolved around me and I had to make that change is to get out of the center of the universe. Let the center of the universe be somewhere else besides in me. And then I could see other people for what they were. I could see other people doing good. I started thinking a little more of other people than myself. As soon as I stop being selfish, you know, and they tell you things in AA meetings and live meetings. And years ago, it was probably, I haven't heard it as much lately, but they used to say, you know, when you're pointing your finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back at you. And when we get that through our head that yes, people in the world are wrong sometimes, but us judging them for being wrong and us taking actions to face them because they're wrong is even worse because we're causing conflict or causing a con confrontation and we're causing arguments. So that's not the way to go. And it says, so we must get rid of the selfishness. We must, or it kills us. God makes it possible. And there are often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. This is an important thing to let sink into your head in step three is we need God's help. It's not that we want God's help. It's not that we could do it some other way, but God's help is there so I could take advantage of it. 
No, we need God's help. It's the only way out. And I'm not a religious guy. I never had fun in religion. I never got fully wrapped up in any particular religion. I went to some churches and they never satisfied me. And I was never interested in God. And I never prayed on a regular basis. I never did any of that. And then when I came into AA, of course, first AA meeting, the very first thing I did was pray. And then at the end of that meeting, the very last thing I did was pray. And every meeting started with a prayer, ended with a prayer. And in the middle, we talked about God. And eventually, I started seeing that the people in these rooms were right about that. They taught me a lot of stuff. They showed a lot of evidence that God exists and that God is personal to us. That God, we can have a direct relationship with God as our best friend. It's there. It's possible. So we had to work at it. Now, remember that in step one, we admitted we were powerless. And for the first three or four chapters of this book, they kept telling us in this book that we were powerless to help ourselves get over alcoholism. We could not do it. We're powerless. We're unmanageable. You know, when I first got into AA, I was in a homeless shelter. They told me what time to eat, what time to shower, what time to go to bed, what time to do the laundry, what time I could leave, what time I had to be back. Every single part of my life was managed by another person, not me. The part of admitting my life was unmanageable was pretty simple. And admitting I was an alcoholic was, you know, an already known fact in my head, but I had never said it out loud. And finally in AA, I said it out loud. Once I did that, then I was on the road. But I had to do more. I couldn't do much by myself. So I did come to believe in a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity, although I kept saying, well, I'm not really insane. Well, that's not exactly what it means either. So we'll get to that a little bit later too. So this is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. So thinking, no, 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 you got to see it my way. I used to always say it. No, no, no. You got to understand. That was how I started most of my sentences in any kind of discussion with anybody else. They had to understand what I was saying. I didn't have to understand what they were saying. They had to understand what I was saying. And I was perseverant in that. And I kept saying, you've got to understand. Why? Why does anybody have to understand me? But that was my stance. And I stood strong. That was playing God, and it doesn't work. Next, it says, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, like this little play, in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of a new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. So freedom from what? Freedom from the agony we have lived in in the past. We had so many problems, we built a wall around us. You know, we said, you know, I don't want these people to bother me, so I'll put up a wall. And we put up a wall in front of us that was full of our resentments and angers and all those things. And we put these this rock wall up. Well, people started walking around the end of the wall and looking at us anyway. So we built the wall down both sides of us. We were trying to stop the interference of other people. And they still, they walked around to the back and they looked at us from the back. So we built the wall all around us to block out other people so they couldn't affect us. And we built it up nice and high so they couldn't look over the top. And so here we are in this structure we built for ourselves and then when the light bulb comes on one day you find out that what you've done is built yourself a prison and you're in your own prison you've built it all the way around you nobody can get in but the problem is you can't get out and you've built it up so high you can't get over it you can't get out 
you're trapped in your own prison and you're stuck with all those ideas, all those behaviors, all those symptoms, and you're stuck with them. And you're wanting to be free, but you don't know how to get free. We have to knock down that wall somehow, and we can't do it ourselves, so we ask for help. And the help we ask is of God, our higher power, as we understand Him. So, what's the solution here? Top of page 63. These are, we're going to read the promises of step three. This is what step three tells us is waiting for us if we do this step thoroughly and correctly. And it starts out by saying, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things had followed. Did we have a lot of remarkable things happening before this? No. We were in a prison. We were in misery. That's why we came in here. We can't cope with it anymore. We can't do anything with it. We've got to be here. We've got to get some help. And this is the place where we can find that help. Remarkable things started happening. It says we had a new employer. And that is God. And that employer in the book is, the word employer is capitalized. So it's another reference to God. It says, being all powerful, he provided what we needed. So we can get everything we need from God, provided that we kept close to him and performed his work well. So this is the action we have to take. If we want to be freed from that prison and live a better life, live a more successful life than we've been living, then we have to do a little work for that. We have to keep God close and we have to perform his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and design. So once we make this decision and once we pull God close to us and we stay close and we do the few simple things he wants us to do, then we lose our selfishness. We stop thinking only of ourselves, our plans, and our designs. And suddenly, instead of being a taker, we become a giver. It says more and more we become interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. So now instead of taking everything we can get, we're giving back life. And that's in the beginning of the book, in Doctor's Opinion, Bill's Story, in those chapters, they, they talked about a moral psychology. And that moral psychology was never fully exposed there or defined there. But now we get to see right here is what it's talking about. It's when we go from being that selfish person, egotistical, self-centered, everything's about us and everybody else is to blame for anything that happens to me. When we stop thinking like that, and start thinking about others and what we could contribute to life, not what we could take out of life, what we could contribute to life that may benefit others, that may help others, that may make others feel better. When we started trying to think that way, things got better. More and more we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, so here's the reversal of what has happened to us all our lives before. All our lives before, we were getting less and less power. The more we got drunk, the more we got messed up with alcohol, the less we could deal with ourselves. And we lost all power. In step one, we admitted we were powerless. Over and over again, we were powerless, not only for, of, of our drinking, but we were powerless of everything we did. We were powerless. But yet, just with this idea that God is our new employer, he is our father and we are his children, just with that thought alone, we can change ourselves around and go to giving to life rather than taking from life. And we feel new power flow in. So we start getting power back. All that power we had lost that we needed so desperately through our drinking careers and our previous life to coming in to this program, we now have power coming in. 
we have power to be able to do things, such as not pick up a drink. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, I had very little peace of mind in the crazy days. Nothing was very peaceful. Work wasn't peaceful. Family life wasn't peaceful. Nothing was peaceful. But now we get a little peace of mind. As we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. We were reborn. Reborn into a new way of life. Not the old way of life, not that road that led us to hell and the clanging gates of hell, but a new life. We were reborn into a new situation where things are only going to get better. And that's important. But we have to sincerely take such a position and we have to get established on a good footing in order to have this come about. We have to get God close to us and we have to do his work well, which is very simple work. It's not like a chore. It's simple work. So we have stuff to do to set this thing in motion. So if we think of all those things, then we were now at step three. Many of us said to our maker, as we understood him, and here's the third step prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thy will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. We're turning our will and our lives over to this God, this power greater than ourselves, so that he can build us into something that is good. And all the crap that we went through as alcoholics, there was still good about all of us. And this prayer frees us from that bad stuff and leaves behind the stuff that's good. So God has plenty of good stuff to work with. So he makes all the good things better and then frees us from the things that have been holding us in bondage. Relieve me of the bondage of self. So God removes the selfishness, takes away the selfishness, so there's less selfishness. So then, therefore, there's more giving. There's more contributing to life. There's more of everything that we want, less of the stuff we don't. And why do we want God to relieve us of the bondage of self? Why would we want God to do that? Well, it says right there, the reason is that I may better do thy will. So we're wanting this to happen so we have the work to do to do God's will. And it says, take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness. So we want to demonstrate. We want to show. We want to share the good things of God. And if he takes away your difficulties, then victory over your problems, victory over the obsession to drink, victory over all those things that we've done in our life that we're ashamed of and we're not, not interested in and don't want to have happen, victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. And the way of life is the way of the spiritual life that's, that's taught us in this book. May I do thy will always. Great prayer if you if you just feel like saying a quick six-word prayer, there it is. May I do thy will always. It says, we thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. This is where surrender comes into this step. We surrender in AA, they say you surrender to win. If you surrender in a chess game, you lose. You sh surrender in a war, you lose. You surrender to the police, you lose. 
in AA, when you surrender, you win. And you win by having the freedom to contribute to life, to love other people, to help other people. And in the basics of AA, you, you learn to be able to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And it all starts with this step. If we do this step as thoroughly as possible, surrender, get down on your knees and give it away, give it to God and completely surrender. And then it says, we found it very desirable to take this spiritual step with an understanding person such as our wife, best friend, our spiritual advisor. But it is better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. The wording, of course, was optional. So long as we express the idea, voicing it without reservation. This is only a beginning, though, if honestly and humbly made, an effect, sometimes a very great one, was felt at once. So in our steps so far, this is the first time that it's truly possible if you do this step completely thoroughly and right and with the humility and the willingness and the honesty that's required, you can have a great vital spiritual experience, which is our goal in these steps, and it starts here. Remember, step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, well, this is the first place you get a real taste of that spiritual experience that spiritual awakening. It begins at step three, when you sign that contract to go through with the rest of the steps, when you make your commitment in this step to continue on and take all the necessary actions and take the spiritual principles that are the steps and put them to effect in your life and the thought of drinking will go away. You won't have that issue anymore. You'll be happy, joyous, and free and it's incredible but it all starts here with an absolute surrender to a power greater than ourselves and as soon as we do that we're ready to take even more action and we'll talk about that next week thank you all very much